so today i'm going to be talking about uh we're building web app for everyone which means it 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 should be accessible uh before i start just a quick introduction about myself i'm a web engineer at n26 and we really care about accessibility a lot so yes that's why i'm here today and i'm one of the organizers at react india and uh, you can find me on twitter uh manjula du manjula underscore dubey if you want to follow me so let's start right let's start talking about it uh i don't think accessibility is like a barrier to innovation because i think uh, it's a whole lot of different world where we're already so innovative about technology so nothing stops us from building accessible apps right it's it's next level to innovation what i see accessibility as so today what i'm going to be talking about is le with react which means it will also give few examples how you should be building your components in react mostly what i'll be covering today is uh, screen readers so uh, the most of the examples would be for screen readers which means uh, by uh, they 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 are having a low vision maybe you know color contrast or maybe they are uh, differently blind users so what do you see on the slide nothing this is what happens when a when a blind person actually comes to your website and you know you need to make sure that you are get, making the user feel that he can use all the assistive technologies available in the chrome right and for th for that you need to basically write your html in a semantic manner so next uh, to talk about what is wcag uh, is nothing but uh, it's called the full form is called web content accessibility guidelines which are the set of standards they actually put in that you have to follow to make your site accessible that's simple like we have certain standards and this needs to be followed to build an accessible app but wcag is basically categorized into three separate versions and they are a aa and aaa which means this is a success criteria for you to follow whether your app is accessible or not so if you uh, if you are on aa that means you have like you know if you you've taken care of accessibility in general and if you are like aaa which all of us cannot be because you cannot manage to be on a aaa level where you manage to basically understand all of your content and make it usable for your assistive users like the users who, who are blind right so it's good to be there with aaa because uh, european laws and regulations mentions that your website should be accessible with aaa so you need to be in that in that standards next why do, like um we had a talk in the morning also about accessibility and today the last talk of the day also ends with accessibility but why why are we talking about it so much like why does it matter so first of all in this world which is about 7.7 billion population all of us are online right it's your friends right it's your grandparents but it's also some of the regulatory organizations monitoring us whether our web app is accessible or not right for example if it is not there are companies who have been sued for not being accessible for example you in us it really matters that you serve all users whether they they are from any gender or you know whether they are disabled so it really doesn't matter but you basically need to serve all of your users so first of all i think we have a very wrong view of disability for example i when i started doing a lot of accessibility work for me it was just blind users but it it's beyond that it's more than that it's not just blind users it it's more than that so 
everybody has a different perception about it, if you see. But one in every 10 users has some kind of disability. If you see every user coming to your web app or website might fall in any of the categories you see from here, right? So your users can be any one of them. They can be with visual impairment. They can be somebody who is motor and physical impairment. They can be someone who is, you know, the, who has some disability with cognitive learnings. For example, math. I was very bad at math. So, you know, you, you need to serve all of these users. Also, like, you know, accessibility also depends on situation. For example, you might just break your arm. You met with an accident. So you cannot say that you do not want to build a website which is not accessible for everyone. For example, even I can fall in that category sometime, right? So we, ha we have to build it for everyone. Also, I, I always had this in my previous company. We didn't really care about accessibility at all. Like I had every other person saying that, I don't think we need it right now in the company, but why? You know, you don't know your users. Maybe your users are using it, um, and it's a bounce rate. For example, they're coming to your website, and they're seeing, okay, it's not at all assistive. I mean, I, as a user, cannot use it. Let's, I mean, let me go somewhere else. There's a huge gap there, and you're also losing your users. So let's quickly run through some of the principles. This is just a theory, but these, this is important because Accessibility revolves around these four principles, which is also called as POUR, for example, P-O-U-R. And by, let's quickly discuss how they basically fall into. So if you see perceivable, this means that whatever content you're putting on the web page should be processed by all the users. And this can be like any format you're putting up on the page, this has to be processed by the user. Second is operable, which means it should be navigatable by your users. That means your users should be using keyboard and they should be navigating through your website. For example, if the user cannot hear, you should have some text. And if the user cannot see, you should have some audio, right? So you should be able to operate all kinds of users. Third is understandable, which means all the content on your web page should be really understandable in a way that every user who visits your website, whether he is visually sighted user or he is not sighted user, he or she or they should be basically scanning the website and they should understand each and every content of your website or a web app. Robust, by this I mean, it should be plat it shouldn't be a platform de independent right i mean it should serve all the platform it should run in all the browsers for example ie right it should it should be robust for example so build it for everyone by everyone i mean all the 7.7 .7 billion population people you have around in the world that means making it accessible through keyboards Having a live captioning, right? Having a live transcript, which is already there. Making sure that your color contrast works in a manner where it passes double A, which I meant that from the European laws, you should be making sure that it passes double A conformance. So one more thing, like I, I had a pretty huge discussion even in my last company that, you know, frameworks are barriers to building accessible apps, which is not the case. So whether it is Angular, whether it is React, or it's a view, you still are writing HTML. So no matter what, if, 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 even if it is JSX, you still are writing HTML, right? So nothing, no framework stops you from building an accessible app. That's the point. Like, you use any sort of framework, it doesn't matter. So, what should we do? Right when you start your project, start writing semantic HTML. By semantic, I mean start writing good HTML and not just divs, 
just because you need it. So start understanding what kind of semantic HTML you need for a page. If it's a form, go and put a form and not a divs, right? So that's how it is. So accessibility is built in browsers. It's not a switch. You turn it on and you turn it off. It's basically there in browsers. It's just for us to use it. So things to keep in mind. Like this is in general not related to anything to do with React. So how many of you know this? OK, so basically this is a color contrast. So your designers might be building, coming up with the brand colors if they're starting a startup. Or you know, you, you always tend to play with colors, especially you, when you're front end dev. And as a developer, also, you should know while your designer has given something to you and you're designing it, you should know whether it passes the conformance level that's needed to build an accessible app. Right? For example, let me quickly show you what happens. So this is basically used against text color and background color. So it bas basically shows you the contrast, if it's valid or not, if the conformance level is to the success criteria. So let me put the background color as maybe white. And let's put the text color as yellow. It's not perfect. <laughs> Correct. So that's how, that's how you basically see that the color contra contrast here basically fails, which means you shouldn't be while designing, or as a designer, or as a developer, you should be taking care of the color contrast as well. So color contrast is also present in dev tools. For example, if you go in your Chrome dev tools, you can actually see the contrast. So while building, you can also take care of this. <coughs> OK. Cool. So next thing, what I believe is we should be using battle-tested libraries, which means which is already there around in the ecosystem. Somebody has built it, and which says, OK, it's accessible. So why not use that? Why reinvent the wheel? So if you know something is already there, just use it. Make sure that, you know, how, ma how many of you like the light mode of IDE? No one? How many like the dark mode? So see? So you should support both, right? You should have, uh, you should support both light mode, because for some users, light mode, uh, mode is really, you know, they do not put a lot of constraint to the eyes. For example, for some people, it's vice versa. So support both of, both of the modes in your app, if possible. Having a descriptive name for all text, which all of us know, but what, what I mean by descriptive, let's quickly see. So you see here two men, right? They're standing with a flag here. How would you do that in React? It's simple. You like, you would say image source, all two men holding a flag. How can it be more descriptive? Two men holding US flag, right? If you see, it's more descriptive. So when the assistive user comes here, what it would say is two men holding US flag. Like, this makes it more descriptive for the user who is non-sighted and who is vit visiting your website. Unique titles. So each of the page that you're serving a user to, so that the user has a context of what page he is on, you should give a unique title to that page. So let's, we already saw some of the general things. Let's see something with React. So. First and very foremost thing is when you are uh, working with React, something changes and something still remains the same because, as, because it is HTML. What changes here is casing of the attributes. So some casing of the attributes is differently written in React. For example, if you're using tab index, if you're using content editable, and if you're using max length, while all the area attributes is still supported in JSX, so they remain as it is. 
This is hard time, I still keep telling people. Start using fragments instead of divs. Now, why is this a term? Like, why should we do that? Because fragments do not add an extra node, right? And divs do add an extra node. I remember like when I started doing React, just because I couldn't return two elements, adjacent elements from it, I used to wrap it with div. No matter what, div. No matter what, div, but don't do that. Handling forms. So uh, there are three most important stuff while you deal with forms, which we'll see. The so first of, f first of one is required fields, second is errors, and third one is disabled buttons. So let's quickly see our input component, how you would basically create an input, input component in React, which is accessible as well right, for the assistive users, for the users who do not have site and they are basically coming to your website. So let's say something like this. There's a first name and, you know, basically the field is required field. So what you would do is you would create an input component and you would pass all of the ID type as a prop, correct? And you, are, you have al also passed required, which because you know for sure that this input is a required thing in my form. So when you render, like in your input component, it looks something like this. So you have a label and you have an input. So a label and an input should always be attached because label gives you, a vi label gives basically the uh, visual users a description of what the field is. Right, so the f for the visual users, you give a label and you have an input. So everything works fine, you have a required attribute on the input. But let's say what you see here is I have also passed area required true. The reason I have passed is this is the thing that the screen readers read. And that's how they know, okay, fine, this field is required. So when the focus is on the input, basically they know that this field is required. But when you don't pass the area required as true, basically it will not be read by the screen readers. So your user would not even know that this field is required. So make sure when you are adding a required as a prop, you also make sure that you also add an area required true as a prop to the input. So let's say you have a multiple fields, which means I have input as a first name, input as a last name, I mean, I have a set of fields, but now I know for sure that all of the fields are required fields. So you basically have something saying at the top, listen, fields marked with asterisk are required. Now when the, use, when the screen readers scan through your page, they will read this as an instruction and tell you, and basically now the non-sighted user knows that all of the fields is required one. So when you have some, some use case where certain things is required, like for example, you already know that all of the fields are required, just put a small description at the top which helps, which might help this user to understand that, okay, all of the fields are required one. So this is how the input will look like, like in the browser, this is how it would look like. You will have a label, you will have an input, you will have a label and an input, and basically there'll be uh, required from the assistive uh, technology. So now, how to handle errors? This is a complex thing, but all of us do that because let's say you're adding a invalid stuff in your input and you know you want to basically say okay this is invalid email address or this is something th that you're that you're at, that you're putting to the input is an invalid so how you would do that so let's say i have an input component right i also have an errors component now always make sure that your errors are always associated to your input field like if the input if the input field 
if in the input field something goes wrong, make sure the errors are dis displayed just next to the field. So now what happens here is I have an errors with ID email errors. And what I have done in the input field saying that this input should be described by email errors, with, which means if something goes wrong, if something, if there is an error in this field, this will be described by the error. So if you see, there is always an association with the error component and the input field. So this is how you do it. Next, if you want to see how the errors component look like, is we have an error. The important thing here is the, error compo the errors component basically has a div with the role alert. So what helps the the uh, screen readers here, basically when the screen reader will actually read it, they will know that this is some of the sensitive information and this is an alert which they shouldn't skip. So this now they know, okay, you know, something important is shown up on the screen and we need to fix it and only then we can submit the form. So next in the form, well, one of the things which is very important is disabled buttons because we all of us have it, right? Let's quickly see how we would do that. So let's say we have an action component which has a disabled as a prop, right? Now what happens if you have a disabled prop, you basically apply a disabled prop, disabled attribute to the button, right? So you would do something like this, which is good. Okay, but now what happens is when you apply a disabled attribute to a button, basically it is not only disabled from the users who are like a normal users, but also from the non-sighted users. So what happens is this basically gets removed from the accessibility tree. So the moment when you say disabled, something which is disabled, for example, you say a button which should be disabled, it gets removed from the accessibility tree, which means now when your now when your user who is non-sighted, who is using a screen reader, will scan through the HTML page or your website, he will not find this button at all because it's already removed from your accessibility tree. So what would you do in that case? In that case, you would basically use area disabled and not the disabled prop. And you would style the button for the visual users to make it look disabled. And what you would also do, just to prevent the submit of the form, you would also say pointer events to none, which means it will prevent an on-click on the button. So visually, as a user, I see it is disabled by applying some styles. But when the screen reader also scans through this web page, they can see, okay, you know, it's disabled. So this way you're also handling your users who are using screen readers. Now, for example, let's say you want to hide a content from both screen readers and your users who are visually, who, who are visual users. What you would do is basically have a prop which says, allowed disabled. Now when this prop is there, sure you can apply a disabled attribute to your button. So now you know, okay, this content, like basically this button should be disabled for both screen readers and your visual users. So this makes it more applicable. Next is a self-explanatory button, which means the uh, content should be more explainable in a sense that, for example, let's say there's a normal button which says book room. As a user, I can see it, so I know it's a button which says book a room, so something will happen. As a user who's non-sighted, the screen reader will go ahead and read the same thing, so you know. So it's more explanatory, right, as a user, also as a visual user, and also as a user where you're non-sighted user. Let's say it's an icon, what would happen in that case? I mean, as a visual user, I know for sure things are happening for me, right? But the user who's using this screen reader would not even know what's happening in here, 
right because it's an icon and what this icon is actually trying to do i don't know right so mhm mm let's quickly see what it would look like so you have a button component which handles the on click okay fine but you also have an area label now what you've done the main thing that you've done here is you've basically wrapped your icon component around your button component and your button component here is nothing but it renders the button the simple uh, semantic html so now you make sure that while you click on this icon you basically the screen reader will actually read padlock toggle because you've given that in an area label right it it will basically read padlock toggle and now the non sighted user knows that he has clicked a button which is like padlock toggle right so you should give some context to your non sighted user where he could understand that what's happening with this icon so dom and the visual order this is one of the thing very uh, you, you should use it very carefully for example there are, there is lot to do with flex right you can basically say reverse the column you can say reverse the row and what not which is good for us because i don't like to write css i mean it's good it's so automated like you know something can just be <laughs> but you know for the users for the users who are using screen readers when you say tap 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 something they they might get confused with this because when you apply flex direction say reverse reverse row your button or dom changes but the order still remains the same in your real dom what happens when you say tap 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 the focus the users who's non sighted might lose the context or he might get confused what's happening right so you should be very careful while applying all of these properties especially with flex so hiding content uh we all do that right i mean we do hide content because of we are front end devs there's often you know scenarios where we would have where we would need to hide content so for example let's say you want to hide something we say display none right yes but again like when you say display none or visibility hidden the contents also get hidden from the screen readers because this will not be at, at all be visible for the screen readers in that case what you do is if you want to make sure that certain things are visible to the screen readers like you know the content should be visible what you do is these are the set of css which would make it uh, which would make it appear for the screen readers and this is like a set of css collections which you can also find it online and you would basically create let's say you know a set of helper which helps you collecting uh, so that it is accessible to the screen readers now when you want to use it in any of the components that you are using you would just go and use it so what happens here that content that particular content will be al will also be visible to the screen readers so this is a set of helpers that you can use and the moment uh, this is nothing but this uh, this is like css and js whatever css and js library you use you have the, the component name and then you would apply that css to that particular element so this is basically now be visible to the screen readers as well now we also have a component like just like just so that you do not do not want to proxy the uh, style stuff style utils what you would also can do is you can have we you can have it as a component which means wherever you hide it uh whatever like whichever component which whichever component or element you want to hide it you can wrap around with that and that will be visually hidden but still be available to the screen readers so icons which we already discussed but let's go through it so this is uh this is mandatory that you often associate your icons with the text because it makes it easier for the screen readers if they're clicking on the icons 
some more about action component. So let's say your action component basically also decides what to render, whether to render button, whether to render, you know, a link or a, a tag, right? So let's say what, what I'm doing on the left hand side is I'm basically having an action component where I say, okay, type is button, which is a prop that I'm passing. And now in this case, if let's say you get a power that the action component decides that whether it will be a button, whether it will be a link or whether it will be an A tag that will be rendered, right? For example, when you say type button, that means you would basically render a button. But when you say target equal to blank, that means you would basically render an A tag where you would say, you know, target equal to blank. So your one component basically makes it possible to render what you want, which is also accessible to the users. Handling dialogues. This is one of the main concern because what happens is basically, why, uh, I I'll show you this example. This is called area uh, React Area Model. And the way it functions is what we want as a user is when we click on the model, basically the focus should be inside the model, right? And not on the page. So this is how it also makes a difference for the users who are the screen readers. For example, they know that when they are clicking this button, something which is focused now, I mean, the focus is already gone to the model. So this is very important. For example, you should totally go through uh, React area model, because this is one of the accessible models, uh, which is in React, if you're working with React. Uh, yes, we have one more model, which I would like to discuss. There is also React LE dialog. So if you're using models a lot in your company and you want it to be accessible, you should also uh, visit this. This is, this is same as what I just showed you. So now we talked a lot about how to build components, how it should be. Also, like as a beginner, when, where you don't know how and what we should do to test it, let's have a quick look what we can use to make sure we build an accessible apps. So there's this ESLint plugin, which basically enforces you if you do not follow an accessibility rule. So it will basically say, hey, hey hello. You know, you forgot the alt tag. Go and fill in your alt tag. So basically, this is like an ESLint plugin, which you can configure in your ESLint configuration. Second is uh, React Axe. What uh, this does is uh, this basically audits your uh, page and gives you and runs an accessibility uh, issues and if there is a something, some accessible issues present on your page, it basically consoles on your browser. So you know, okay, you know, things are wrong. So this ha uh, it has serious moderate issues. So you know for sure that which one you should pick up and fix, right? Next is. Uh, Agnostic Axe, which is built by one of my coworkers who's sitting there. Hello. <laughs> and uh, so this is what, this is uh, same as uh, React X, but has few advantages over React X. The advantages that it has is first of all, it's framework agnostic. I mean, you don't need uh, to run a React app and you it can be an angular, amber, or whatever you want. And basically, it runs the audit only if the DOM changes. So for example, what happens with React Max, it runs the audit on re-render of the component. But what happens with agnostic Ax is it only audits when your DOM changes. So that means it uses less resources. So I would prefer uh, using agnostic acts, and that's what we use at N26 as well. So you should try it too. Next is PA11Y, uh, which is also called as Pelly. This is like an automated, uh, automated testing uh, PAL, which means 
what you could do is uh, this basically uh, as an command line uh, command line interface which loads your web page and once you load your web page you can basically have a test audits against it which will be shown in the command line whether or not if something is failing or is there some accessibility issue one thing you could do is you could always include this in your builds so for example something new is coming up the build would basically make sure that you know something is wrong with this so what you need to do is npm install and if you see on the left hand side what i'm trying to do is basically peli and the website so as a beginner if you really want to see whether your website is accessible or not go and try this trust me it will give you some good results if it is not accessible <laughs> and uh, the third thing that you see is if you want to see only the critical errors that means as a beginner you would not go and fix everything right if you're starting out you would not fix the warnings or notice first you want to fix the critical errors so if you ignored warning and notice it would just pop up critical errors so basically just go and fix this uh also it has a reporter uh, cli i mean it's inbuilt the reporter cli is inbuilt in peli so it basically reports whatever is wrong in and not meeting the accessibility requirements and that's it some other tools that you should uh, basically use it for example react le and uh, color contrast checker if you if you if you're a designer or you want to make sure that you know the brand colors that we're using should be the accessible ones one good thing is <coughs> storybook addons which i recently discovered what happens is all of us build design systems right and we use storybook right and uh, if you want to make sure that the components that you are building is accessible or not you can have this add on in your storybook so while you are building you actually know what are the violations and what you should fix so some sanity checklist that you know you as a developer should know have a dark mode which i already said have a light mode user preferences always check whether the button label all the content on your page also you know the image tag is descriptive no matter what don't give the users an auto play of a video yeah don't do that uh make sure make sure that you know you're satisfying the contrast level there's enough contrast make sure everything is readable everything is understandable everything is structured for example i used to mess a lot with the h1 tags don't do that use them in proper order proper hierarchy like there should be only one h1 tags per page according to me make sure you have live captioning and transcript wherever possible and uh, like this is most important if some users are uh, not used to you know strong animations make sure that you make it configurable for example if they want to have no animations you still serve your web app you'd still serve your website thank you <laughs>